In Revelation chapter 13, as it flows over from chapter 12, we see the dragon again. And John is positioned to see two beasts. One comes up out of the sea, the other one out of the land. We're going to talk about the first beast today in the Word. Good morning and welcome back to Today in the Word. Thank you for walking through the book of Revelation with us. We're in chapter 13 today. For those of you that are listening to us on our podcast, I want to welcome you as well as all of you here on YouTube. If you've not subscribed or followed or passed these out on social media, would you take a moment and do so? If you're on YouTube, just click that little button and subscribe and let's get the word out. Chapter 13 is a pivotal chapter as we walk through the book of Revelation. I want to remind you that in the Bible, prophecy is about God and His covenant. Biblical prophecy is not about sensational today in the news trying to determine what's going to happen today prophecy. You don't see that in the Old Testament prophecy. You don't see it in the New Testament prophecy. It's about a covenantal God with His people, showing how Christ Himself is glorified through them. That's important as we go through these images, reminding ourselves that we let the Bible interpret the Bible, and notice that all of these, what we might call symbolisms, are reflections upon literal things that are happening, or revealing literal things, as the book of Revelation is told that it is. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. So let's get right into this chapter, beginning at verse 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion, and the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne in great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole land was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because it had given authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war? against it. All right, we see two beasts in this chapter. Let's look at the first beast. Notice it comes up out of the sea. Now, we've already seen in, through the book of Revelation, as we've taught, that the sea represents the nations, particularly the Gentile nations. And we see this beast coming up out of the sea, and we're going to see that it represents Rome. We see the dragon standing on the shore, and two beasts are seen. The first beast comes up out of the waters or out of the seas. We know from earlier studies that seas represents the nations. We saw that in Isaiah 60. We also hear it directly in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, where John is told, the angel said to him, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So letting the Bible interpret the Bible, the image that we see here is a power, a beast, a nation coming forth out of the nations, or a beast of power coming up out of the nations. This symbolizes Rome, not just Rome as a nation, but a world power opposing the covenant of God. Daniel prophesied these world powers beginning with Babylon, then Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And in the days of those kings, in the time of Rome, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom. Now the kingdom that is established was established from the very beginning. It's called God's kingdom. But Christ's authority, Christ's portion of the kingdom that he rules and reigns is from the first advent to the last advent when he will turn the kingdom over to Father God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then the end will come. This is Messiah's day, the kingdom, 
Now, it started in the ascension, but it's going to be really realized when the temple and Israel are destroyed, the only thing that's left is God's people in the kingdom to be seen. The opposition to this kingdom is, sort, of course, is the dragon, but giving power to these beasts. The first one here is Rome as it comes up out of the sea of the nations. The Roman Empire is seen in terms of being against, so to speak, or in relationship to the land or Israel, apostate Israel, and the church, the true Israel, the people of God. So we're going to see the authority that the beast had. Now it's mentioned that he had ten horns and seven heads, which is a mirror image of the dragon or the devil in the previous chapter, in chapter 12, verse 3. Which, by the way, behind me, if you see this statue, if you're watching on YouTube, that's Michael defeating Satan. We have this image right here in our home as a reminder that Christ has won the victory through the cross. I just thought I'd mention that since we haven't talked about it as we go through this. But that's exactly what we're seeing, where the dragon gives authority and power to Rome, the beast, it mirrors it because that's important for us to see the connection. Ten crowned horns or powers of the beast are explained further in Revelation 17 when we get into the ten governors of the provinces of their imperial power. Now, these seven heads are also explained in the line of seven Caesars. And we'll see that the seven heads, we're told, are seven hills on which the woman sits. That's declared in chapter 17 of Revelation. And there are also seven kings, it says. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, but when he comes, he must remain for a little while. Now, as we walk through these, we'll discover that Nero is one of those heads. And that will be very important for us to see because the Christians were facing these apocalyptic, nearly like end of the world, events, and they needed to be understood. They needed to see what was taking place. Now, what you and I need to be reminded of, that emperor worship was so powerful. Now, we know this from church history. Uh, Nero was one of the worst. We'll talk about his ravenous, <laughs> uh, evil, terrible events that he did to the Christians, burning them on the stake, giving light for his perverted parties, dressing up like a beast himself, raping both men and women, rushing up on them and eating their private parts as they hung out. It, it, was, it was terrible, history tells us, of, of Nero and, and how he actually was demonized as he came forth. But during that day, emperors were required just call on people to worship. They expected worship. In fact, Christians lost their lives, not just because they love Jesus, but because they f f uh, refused to bow down to the emperor. In the whole Asia Minor area, the seven churches we read about under persecution came because of opposition from these emperors. We've all heard of Caesar Augustus. The name Augustus means the exalted one, means the sacred one, means the one who's worthy to be worshipped. These emperors actually demanded that they were treated as God. They thought themselves to be God. Nero commanded absolute obedience. And at one place, he built a 100-foot bronze statue of himself, and he placed it in the Colossus of Nero, it's called, or in the vestibule of what was called the Domus Aurea. This was nothing more than a pleasure palace, such as the world has never seen before or since. And history tells us it covered up to 100 to 300 acres, this huge construction. It was a time of great debauchery. And no wonder Paul spoke against Caesar, and he called him the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians. He said, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above, above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. That was Nero. That's what those emperors thought of themselves. And so John tells us that this beast, this power, 
had the appearance of like a leopard, feet like those of a bear, and the mouth of like a lion. Now, those are the very animals that are listed in reverse order, of course. But from chapter 7 of Daniel, we see Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and now this terrible fourth beast of Rome. Let me read it to you in Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It, it crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the other former beasts, and it had ten horns. See, Daniel saw ahead of the days of his people, and he knew of these transitional times that in those days that God would set up a kingdom. And he spoke of this fourth beast, which was terrible Rome. Now, we're told that one of the heads seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the wound was healed. Now, the fact that when you hear the term, a fatal wound to the head, should remind us of the first prophecy of Jesus and his victory by wounding the head of the seed of the serpent. In Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. The serpent would bruise his heel, talking about the crucifixion, the cross. But the cross itself and the victory of Christ would crush the head of the serpent. And so Daniel had prophesied, as we said, these days of Christ's kingdom when he'd set up the kingdom and it would fulfill and go forth through the preaching of the gospel and all the nations would flow into it. Did you know during that first generation, the church grew so fast that it actually had an effect upon the culture and society to such a degree that even members of Caesar's household came to Christ, it says in Philippians chapter 4. And history tells us that Tiberius Caesar even formally requested that the Roman Senate officially acknowledge Christ and his divinity. It almost as if Rome was not going to live past Christianity because it grew so fast. It had such power. Now, we know later Rome was affected in the 4th and 5th century and came to an end because of the gospel and because of Christianity. However, what seemed like great victory for the church, as if there was a great wound to the beast, Things were reversed, and tragically, persecution began to break out like never before against the early church. Paul wrote about these days called perilous times, where people be lovers of the flesh, lovers of themselves, and, and traitors against God and against parents. He warned Timothy that these perilous times would come, that people would depart from the faith. We understand that the scriptures teach us of these events were taking place and happening. So, the beast had received a head wound. It looked as if it was all over, but it became alive again. Now, the reality of Christ did defeat the, uh, the dragon who was given authority to the beast, but it would have to be lived out, the perseverance of the saints. The saints would take possession through the kingdom as the gospel would go forth. Now, in this passage here, it said that the whole land wandered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which was given power to the beast, because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast. So as they gave allegiance and worship to Rome, the beast, they were actually giving worship and allegiance to Satan. Who is like the beast, they said? Who is able to wage war? No one could defeat Rome. Rome was the most powerful force in the earth. And they were... The emperors were expressing their authority and power. But the word here, that everyone of the land, now sometimes it's translated the earth, it's the Greek word, as we've pointed out before, gay, which means land. And 12 times in the book of Revelation, it references apostate Israel as the land. It denotes it as such. So even though it's true that Nero would have been loved in other places of the known world at the time, what really was being dealt with here was the land of Israel. When faced with a choice to choose Caesar or Christ, apostate Israel chose Caesar. For they said, we have no king but Caesar. 
Israel sided with Rome or Caesar or the beast, or you could say against or with the devil against the church. And that's why you see in the book of Revelation, Christ calling the synagogues, the synagogues of Satan. Let's keep reading. The beast was given, this is verse 5, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All the inhabitants of the earth or the land will worship the beast and all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Now here John draws attention to the beast's blasphemies against God and specifically he says against his name and the tabernacle or those who are in heaven. He's really talking about true believers because we've come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. Our citizenship, according to Philippians, is in heaven, not here in this earth. Paul tells us in Ephesians that we're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. So he came against those who were in heaven. He came against those whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life. And all whose names weren't written in the Lamb's book of life went after and worshiped the beast. See, in contrast to those who are on the earth, the new covenant of people, the new covenant people of God, are in the tabernacle of heaven. It's interesting how the beast was given authority to act for 42 months, three and a half years. The breaking of covenant. It was that three and a half symbolic language years that we've seen used already that was given power to war against the saints. John repeats what he's told us when he says, all who dwell on the land, meaning apostate Israel, will worship him. Now, we got to remember when the Bible speaks of worship, it's again, it's not talking about just what we call liturgical worship or that type. It means allegiance and obedience. When we give our lives to allegiance and obedience, we are worshiping. So when faced with this real practical choice, are they going to honor Christ or choose Caesar? They, of course, chose Rome. It's called idolatry. It's a worship of the creature rather than the creator. It's one of the marks of those whose names have never been written in the Lamb's book of life. God's heavenly church membership is shown, as Paul said, before the foundation of the world, that we were chosen in Christ before the world was created, before the foundation, the Father chose us. From the viewpoint of God's eternal decree, those that are His, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. He closes out this portion with this verse in verse 9 and 10. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. In other words, he was saying to the Christians, the believers, persevere in faith. This is time of endurance because those who are determined to be killed will be killed and those who will die by the sword will die by the sword. But this calls for great, great patience and endurance for the saints as they lived in Difficult times, they needed to see that Christ was victorious and that the armies against them and what was opposing them was not just Rome, but it was the dragon who gave power to the beast to persecute the saints. Then they knew that they had already won victory in Christ and they could endure. Let's continue to talk about this. Let's pick up on the second beast the next time today in the Word.